Now we're going into our discussion. Of course, COP28 is still on. But of course, Nigeria president returned back yesterday to Abuja to continue the business of governors right here in Nigeria. But what are the takeaway of, or, or the fallout from that conference? A lot of controversies uh, with regards to the numbers of delegations that Nigeria took to that conference. About 1,411 equivalent of the same number with China. That is what uh, was alleged to have been taken to that conference by Nigeria. But the federal government came out to say, no, we went we only sponsored 422 numbers of delegates. If we can see that graphics quickly before we go into our discussion, the graphics of the number of delegation from Nigeria according to various ministries. Uh, we see the uh, Nigerian government taking, uh, that's uh, is Africa, the top three in Africa, Nigeria taking the leader, 1,411, uh, Morocco, 823 delegates, and of course, uh, Kenya, 765 delegate. Quickly look at Nigeria and see uh, the, the breakdown. Uh, no, this is the Esther code. Let's look at the Nigeria delegation first before we talk about uh, the Esther code. Indeed, uh, we have uh, the federal government delegation uh, from Nigeria. Uh, we have uh, the, the breakdown shows that uh, the National Council on, on Climate Change uh, take 32 delegates, Federal Minister of Environment, 34, all ministries, 167, presidency, 67, uh, office of the vice president, nine. National Assembly 40 and of course the federal parastatals uh, plus agency 73 uh, delegates they were taking uh, were taken uh, to that uh, uh, conference by this uh, uh, by parastatal and indeed agencies uh, let's look at the extra code uh, for ministers indeed uh, we look at the uh, uh, the, the extra cost for a minister, we look at $900 uh, uh, dollars there. If you would break it down, it's actually a very huge number. Uh, let's quickly uh, look at it, uh, go into our uh, discussion quickly and get the reaction to this. My guest is, of course, an environmentalist, uh, Dr. Shimeri Ohajinwa. Glad to have you on Trust TV or Business Daily. Let's quickly get your reaction. So much about the uh, controversy about the delegations, the number of delegations we took from uh, Nigeria to that conference. Do you think we need 422 people to attend a, a conference like this? 1,411. Yeah, did the federal government say they sponsor only 422? Yes, yeah, so um, registration is different from people that actually are, are arrived at the place. So if okay. 1,400 something, this is a country of 200 million people. Exactly. And so 1,400 people registered. It does not mean that all of them mm. attended. Me, I'm supposed to be there. All right. But I, I, I just cancelled my uh, flight last minute because of okay. some things that happened. Okay. So it's not everybody that went. So in terms of the phone and some, if I don't know how many finally arrived there, mm. but the truth is that is a is a large meeting of over eighty thousand people attending, and there are several meetings happening at the same time. Mm. So it's important that Nigeria is in those meetings because Nigeria is a big economy. Mm, indeed. You know, it's a very big economy that we can't afford not to go. Yes, we may not have gone, you know, taking government sponsoring that much number of people. Mm. But again, how many days are they spending? Because mm. some people can go for three days and come back. Some people can go for two days and come back. Mm. They are all still registered as different individuals. But I don't know if the foreign or something are staying all through the 14 days of the conference. All right. But to an extent, it's important we go. But maybe it's important we just focus on people that have something to do so it doesn't look like a holiday so i'm saying it's more like a jamboree given uh the current situation of the economy the government say, is saying that uh, there's no money nigerians are crying and you're taking this large number of delegation uh to such a conference do you think is the right thing to do like you say there are so many meetings that of course nigerians mm -hmm. are actually meant to be there nigeria is meant to be there okay. there are so many mini mini meetings going on at the same time and not all of them will stay for the whole duration oh, so right. they could have probably planned in such a way that some people attend certain meetings and certain days and come back just like president has come back okay. but the conference is ending on the 20th, on 12th not it hasn't ended exactly. so some people will also come back with him mm. yes i don't support such large number that were even more than <laughs> we're even we're more than america <laughs> yeah, and so many but, other developed nations yeah but it's an important meeting uh, uh, all right now let's go let's look at some of the takeaway now from this meeting the meeting is on but will you say the cop 28 comes at a decisive moment for uh, uh uh for international climate action yes okay this year's um this year's team is um i think at at unite and deliver mm. so if you look at our experiences in the last year the the way we have flooding and so many other things happening to farming, um, in, like in the agricultural sector, mm -hmm. with energy and all of that, I think it's important we, we, yeah, it's important that we are there and it's important that we know how to 
um, get something from the table, not just attending for attending's sake, but it's important that we begin to raise the awareness on how we can even take, make most use of the opportunity that is left on the table for us. Mm -hmm. Indeed, that is my major concern. Last year, there was COP27 in Egypt. Promises were made, pledges were made. None of those pledges, to, to the best of my knowledge, has been, you know, actualized for Nigeria. Now, more promises, more investment uh, opportunities are being, you know, proposed. Do you think uh, this is more like a gathering, uh, annual gathering that is not really yielding any positive results, especially when you have to uh, measure the lives of Nigeria? Okay, so it depends on... Um if things are laid on the table, it depends on how prepared you are to take it. Mm. But it doesn't mean that it's not there. Mm. But I think also think Nigeria is doing a lot of things because towards this year, in preparation for COP28, there were a lot of meetings and trainings before they went. They don't just go there. They do a lot of meetings, a lot of documentations are prepared mm. before they go there. So you understand the position of Nigeria and the position of Nigeria in Africa and then the position of Africa as a continent mm. to COP. Mm. So, yeah, that's how they do it. It's not, it's not like, I don't think, it's not like they are not doing anything, but probably it hasn't started yielding results as such. Mm. Yeah, but they are doing a lot. Mm. Yeah. All right, if you say they are doing a lot, there was quite a whole lot that we've experienced uh, this year alone, globally. Uh, it's an unprecedented wildfire, there's flood, there's storms, and a drought, all this thing happens worldwide. And scientists have come out to say that, look, uh, the earth has been a warmer in 2023 than it has in any other year. Mm -hmm. And this is, a very, this is a big threat mm -hmm. to global warming. Uh, what do you think that we should do as a country in our own capacity to ensure that we don't fall a victim of uh, uh, maybe future natural disasters? Okay, yeah. So that's why you're talking about climate actions. Absolutely. Climate justice. Mm. So what are the things you're supposed to do? So in terms of flooding... And the strategies we should adopt. Yeah, so in terms mm. of uh, flooding, for example... How are we doing the, even the basic things like making sure the drainages are cleared, making sure the water, is, the, sea, the river or the drainage are dredged enough? Mm. So the basic things we can do ourselves so that not everything is climate change. Sometimes it's our own behavior, our whole human activity. So most, most of those things are preventable. So if, if there was warning signs there's going to be so much rain, mm. so you're already planning on how to move away from flood lines. You're already planning on how to make sure that the drainage systems are open and cleared. There's no using waste to block everywhere. Mm. You're already making sure people are not building on the flood plains. The water is dredged. So there are plans. So, so those some of these things are not sudden, you mm. know. But how are you, you know, going about it? So the why I'm using flooding is the one that is that mm. happened. You know, it was so yes, devastating exactly. when so, it happened yes, in Nigeria. Exactly. So the same thing happens to um, drought. There are places when you go there. There are droughts. Good example is Especially Israel. In the a good example in, 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 the, in the northern Nigeria as well. Yeah, Egypt, Israel. There are places where it doesn't rain every day, mm. but they still they produce. So there are a lot of technologies in place to make sure that we can still do our agriculture and still provide food because we are not providing food as a problem. Mm. The same thing also happens with... Um, um, Nigeria is doing a lot of things in, in, in looking at soil now. There's a lot of research in soil because if, if our soil is not healthy, forget we won't be able to produce food. A lot of people don't know that soil is a living thing. You know, it, it breathes. Mm. So if you, if you contaminate it, pollute it, then don't expect it to nurture life and give you food to eat. So... Currently, there are things they are doing in that, trying to educate farmers on the kind of things they should use, the kind of type of uh, fertilizer, whether they're going to use organic or synthetic or the mm. combination of both, mm. the type of plants to plant at a particular time because the weather is changing. Mm. So when to move out, so they give them forecasts, uh, they give them about the rain, so you'll know whether you should plant early, harvest early too, and how to go about it. So you don't end up losing anything, losing so much. Mm. So it's a different thing that you just key into that, but... I think they are doing a lot. Yes, they might not be doing enough, but they are quite doing a lot. Now, you reflect from the government angle uh, you're talking about. What about the NGOs? There are so many NGOs. That I think are, it's the uh, NGOs that are even driving it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, that is uh, my, my concern. Uh, when you have an NGO driving uh, such a massive project, and then you have uh, the federal government not doing so much in terms of, uh, if you look at the, uh, I mean, the budget for the Ministry of Environment this year, uh, it's not really something to to write home about. Do you think the investment is coming in that enough for us to be able to mitigate the effect of these disasters that we, most times when it happens, we are not prepared for? Yes, remember that this, when it comes to climate change, it's cross-cutting. Mm. So if you're looking at climate change, you're saying, okay, for environment, there's also 
budget for agriculture, there's budget for transportation. There's, so if you bring them out like that, to an extent, the one we have should be able to do something significant that we can see. Mm. You know, to an extent. So, if what is agriculture doing? So, when you pull them out together, if, they, if you call all of them, uh, climate change, climate change fund, climate change fund, in all the ministries, to an extent, you can do something that that is quite tangible. Mm. So, it doesn't have to necessarily be because well, again, remember, government is there to supervise. It's mm. a supervisory role. Mm. It's not implementing. That's where the NGOs come in to implement certain things. Government is to supervise, provide uh, regulations and policies to make sure that these things are done and the citizens are not taken advantage of. But you implemented their projects, you create the, you create the enabling environment. Then investors, private sector, NGOs come in to make sure that it implements. It's not everything that government does. Mm. All right, we agreed with you. But if you look at also, uh, it's not everything that government does. But I could remember the plant clean Ogoni in a couple of years ago, especially when the former president came on board, when that uh, I mean uh, project was, was uh, said to be the implementation was said to commence. A lot of Nigerians were excited, even those in the Niger Delta, and of course, generally, the whole country were so excited that finally the Ogoni cleanup can actually, you know, begin. But mm -hmm. here we are, uh, almost nine years down the line, mm -hmm. we are still talking about Ogoni cleanup. Nothing is really concrete on the ground. I think they've started the cleaning, but I don't know how far they've gone. But I think they started the cleaning. I don't know if you know about I I prep project. Yes, I think they've started, but maybe it's not moving as it should. The pace. Yes, maybe the pace is not moving as it should be. I don't know much about it, but I think they've started the train. The uh, 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 all right. Let's look at the... There, also, there, is also, there was also talk about the operationalization of lost and damaged fund at COP28. Mm -hmm. uh, the fund is actually meant to alleviate the sufferings of climate frontline communities around the world. And, you know, we have so many of these communities, especially in the Niger Delta region. Uh, according to uh, uh, what has been pledged so far, just $500 million has, has been pledged for that uh, fund. But what is required annually is $400 billion for it. And just you have just a mere $500 million. Uh, how uh, much do you think it should, more should be done for us to have this fund to be able to actualize, uh, I mean, this plan by uh, some of these agencies? Okay, so the loss and damage fund, I, I think we should start from how much have we even assessed. So it can be $4 billion. If you're not ready to assess it, you're not going to assess it. It takes a lot of technicalities to even assess the funds. Mm. If not, if you leave it open like that, every ticker, you know, just, no justification for giving you. Remember, mm. if you're depending on those funds, you're going more like a beggar and a victim. So they dictate the tunes, they dictate the terms and conditions. Mm. So I will start from, even if it's one error, have you assessed any? I don't think we have for mm. now. So mm. we should prepare ourselves enough to be able to assess those funds. That's one of the reasons why they are going for these meetings. Where they, that's why one of the reasons why they should be in the meetings to know what are the terms and conditions. Not that you tell us it's a bring a NASA is a plus, we, because we are not there when they were discussing it. Mm. So if it's not okay, then you can say no, it's not okay. So it's not. I, I don't see that there is got to be four billion when you can't even assess the five hundred that is there. You can't even assess it. Mm. So the more prepared countries will assess it, and you can't assess it. Mm. Uh, talking about the more prepared country, I'm even wondering: Do we even need to go for all these aids in the first place? I think we are rich enough not to go for it, really. But yeah, maybe if you take corruption out of the system, yeah, maybe if you take corruption out, out of the system, yeah, we are more prepared for it. But I, I am not a fan of aid, so maybe I'm not the best person to ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the major concern is actually, you know, uh, uh, a corruption because there's so much fund, but for you to assess it, there's quite a whole lot of, uh, you know, under the table transfer that goes on that really doesn't allow a project to be done as as, as it should be. Uh, let's look at uh, some of the uh, uh, projects that, I mean, the deals that the president has been able to get over the line. Uh, we're told that uh, the electric buses program is on, is uh, also uh, set to be rolled out about 100 buses or thereabouts, and the first phase is set to be, uh, I mean, uh, I mean uh, rolled out in Nigeria from uh, Dubai based on some of the agreement that has been signed so far. Uh, uh, do you think, uh, I don't know, it's been... I'm not a fan of uh, uh, some of these things, but I believe in the, uh, I mean, uh, promoting domestic uh, uh, markets. But bringing all of these things here now, do you think it's not going to? Be, is it, do you think it will not affect our domestic markets? Okay, so um, listening to President Tinubu, um the things that President Tunubu mentioned in his in his um, speech that he said he was going to do, he said 
that Nigeria is, is committed to 100% reduction of gas flaring by 2030. They are committed to making sure they distribute cooking gas to the large population. Mm. We are committed to methane reduction. We are committed to energy mix. So energy mix means we, we are going to be sourcing for energy from different uh, different sources. Mm. You know, make sure that we get it biogas, like renewables, different mm. renewables, wind, energy, water, mm. whatever, to make sure that our population have access to energy. Mm. So for the methane, methane is important for us to reduce because it's, it's a major global warming gas. So how do we even reduce it? They are going to reduce this thing. So for the electric, um, the electric um, buses, the electric buses wasn't one of the things he mentioned, but yes, it's also one of the things they presented at Nigerian Pavilion that they are going to provide it. So you're saying that is it going to affect us? Maybe if you're saying 100 buses, this 200 million people, maybe I think that's a pilot stage. Mm. Because also one of the things that the Wando mm. it was also one of the things that Wando pre uh, presented last year, COP twenty seven, as one of the things they're going to do. Mm. So it, remember, these things take time. So I don't, I don't think so. It's going to really. I don't think we have enough. Mm. Abuja is a very good example. There's no proper public transport system. No. It's not going to affect uh, us. Right, In uh, fact, right. it's going to improve us. All right. And you don't think we need to engage some domestic producers? Like, uh, I don't want to mention their names. We have some of them mm -hmm. uh, yes. produce vehicles in Nigeria. We have I think, quite I think, a whole lot I, of no, them. I think we but it's, should. it looks as if government is uh, comfortable patronizing foreign investors. <laughs> yeah, I think we should. I, I think we should. Whatever it is we want to consume should be done here so that we create jobs. Instead of creating jobs in another country, we are just trying to import and then creating job in another country. So if, if I don't know the details about the electric uh, cars, mm. but I think it's important. Even if you can do 100% of it here, we should be able to do At enough here to create, yeah, to create jobs here. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. So when we are competing with China in terms of the numbers of delegation, we should also compete with them in terms of industrialization <laughs> <Technology>. as well. <laughs> I must thank you, Dr. Chimere Hajumwa, environmentalist. I must thank you for your time on Business Daily. All right. So it's with that, with that is a wrap on the show. Today we'll be back again tomorrow. I am Yusuf Akogun.